Well, hey guys, welcome. Glad you have joined us here today. Um, I'm truly excited to be joining with you and giving an opportunity to go over this One Love series that the church has entered into. And just I want to encourage you that you may not know why you came tonight or you're not certain, but I believe the Lord led you to where you're at, to the small group you're in, and He has a good things in store for you. So I'm excited to see what God will do with you and through you as you listen to um, the message, talk with others, and just get to hear what um, God's Word has for us for the day. So if you've been around the church, you know that uh, the church is going through a One Love campaign, and it's um, basically going to be asking us to first learn about God's love, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to jump into um, how to reach out and love others with it. So the passage that we that uh, Pastor pulled out this week was 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 through 16. So if you have your Bibles in front of you, go ahead and open to 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 16. If you don't have Bible, um, then go ahead. There's on the handout in front of you has ESV as well. So we'll be reading from that. And we're going to start off just by reading 1 Corinthians 5, verse 14 through 16. And that says, For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, and those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. For now, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. And you'll see that the main point of that uh, sermon and that that even that whole passage, is that the love of God found in Christ Jesus motivates us like nothing else. I mean, there's nothing else that should motivate us quite like the love of God and that's found in Christ Jesus. And so let me ask you really quickly, what drives you? I mean, what gets you out of bed in the morning and gets you going? Now, if you're like me, it's coffee and a shower. Both of those get me moving, and as well as, um, for some of you, it's dogs, it's cats, it's pets. All of those kind of get us up and moving. But in a more serious thing is, I mean, what is our motivation? What is our, what is our drive in life? What, what are we striving for? And, you know, for some of us, it's paychecks and just trying to get by, you know, pff, I just want to survive. Others of us, it's money. We're, we're just trying to make, make, make enough money in the bank that we can retire. We want to be successful. We want our lives to matter, a lot of us. I mean, we just want to do something that matters. Personally, what about fear? Does fear motivate us? Because, honestly, I think fear is one of the, the primary motives, motivations for human. It's, um, I mean, most people... At least if you're like me, I fear losing my job. Why? Because I fear not having enough food to eat and I fear about winding up on the street. Or we fear um, losing friendships. That's why we won't say the hard things that are needed, but we're afraid of losing friendships or losing a valued relationships. We fear a meaningless life. And that's why we strive so hard at work. And um, what's interesting is even in Christianity, then we tack on to Christianity this whole thing about a God. You need to fear God. You know, like, it's like, whoa, I need to fear God, which is good and it's healthy. And I, I don't want to dismiss that. But then we start fearing God and we fear failure and we fear the judgment of others in the church that are going to scorn us. See, and now we've not only got the rest of the normal fears, now we've got Christian fears on top of it. And fear almost becomes our primary motivation. <laughs> Let's be honest, for those of us who are single, singleness is its fear in itself. We fear being alone, getting to the graveside and nobody being there, dying in old age alone by ourselves. And so we fear losing friendships and fear lose being alone. But uh, that's not what we're called to be. We are called as believers simply to be motivated by Christ's love. So I want to look you to look at verse 14. Again, so if you have it in your Bibles, open it up. But otherwise, in the handout, it says, The love of Christ controls us. I like the translation that says, the love of Christ compels us. That's like, it, it's a motivation to go out. You know, see, that, that Greek word there for control, it means holding all things together. The love of Christ holds all things together, and it is a positive pressure that pushes us out. It's a positive pressure that motivates us. 
It's not a negative control, which is manipulation, but a positive control is motivation. And I want you to catch that. There are negative controls, which are manipulation, and those we need to be on, we're on our guard against. But the love of Christ is not that. It's not a negative. It's a positive. It's a positive control or compelling, and that's our motivation. You see, we are motivated by Christ's love, and true love always will always, always cost us something. There's no such thing as free love. I mean, there was in the 60s or so they had thought, but the reality is love is never free. True love will cost you, at the minimum, surrender of yourself. Now, that's why Christ stands as the, the greatest love there is, because He surrendered everything for us. And as the pastor had pointed out, there's three things that we just want to, three aspects that we want to look at, the atonement, life, and perspective. You see, Christ's love in the atonement motivates us. Now, atonement is just a fancy word for Christ's death and sacrifice on the cross that frees us from sin, and it's a lot more than that. But essentially for this point is Christ's death purchased us forgiveness. And when you accept that, and that freedom sets you free, uh, that is a motivation to go and talk to people and just love other people because all of a sudden you experience this freeness that you've never experienced before. And so, because Christ laid down His life for us, we are motivated to love not only Him, but other people in return. So Christ's love in the atonement motivates us. But secondly, Christ's love in our life motivates us. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's that now we, we've, we've gotten forgiveness, but then He doesn't leave us there. He's transforming us on the inside. And He's empowering us that we would live for Him. You see... Now we have been empowered because Christ lives in us to move from a me-centered life to a the-centered life. Did you catch that? There's a, there's a subtle, subtle shift there. See, before Christ, it's always about me, my needs, my desires, me, me, me. It's a me-centered life. And then the process of sanctification or growing in holiness is, is letting the Lord switch it so that it's all about thee, meaning the in above and the around me. Those, so it's growing to motivate the lives that we would not live for ourselves anymore, but that we would live for others and for God. And so you, we just look back at his life and that, seeing his example and his life is a motivation for us to find a similar God-oriented life that looks around and looks up. And from that, we are motivated to reach out and love others. And then the third one that was talked about is perspective. That Christ's love is seen in perspective of others which will motivate us. You see, um, the pastor really addressed this amazing and, and he was just noting that every person is made in the image of God. Therefore, every person has both dignity and worth. Both dignity and worth. It doesn't matter how short they are, how tall they are. I'm in the tall side, you know, some of you are in the short side, but so, you know, it doesn't matter how small, how big you are, you know, none of that matters. It, it's every single person, even an atheist has dignity and worth. Even our enemies, the people that work that we don't like, the people who are backstabbing us, they still have dignity and worth because they were created in God's image. If we start seeing people as created in God's image, that shifts and motivates us. You see, the world views people only in terms of a, as a resource, a resource that can be consumed. So you come to work and they pay you because you're a resource that makes them money. As soon as you become an unvaluable resource, you're pushed aside. But the Lord views people in a relationship manner. So the world views them as resources, the Lord views them as relationships, and he invites them into a covenant of relationship that's deep, lasting, and abiding. And so once we start switching around and seeing people as um, image bearers of God that have dignity and worth, that motivates us to love them, even though it may be hard and maybe we not to, not easy, but that, that motivates us. So I'm going to pause here and turn it over to the small groups and just have you wrestle through the first question, which is, of those three aspects, the atonement, new life, and the new perspective on people, which is the most meaningful to you and why? 
And once we're done, we'll go ahead, pause it, and we'll pick up from here. All right, so thank you for sharing which of those aspects of those three aspects of Christ's love was most meaningful to you. And I, you know, I think each one of those aspects shifts as we grow throughout life. Sometimes it's the atonement. Sometimes it's a new life and new holiness that we find. Sometimes it's a relationship. So I think that's not, it's more of a dy uh, dynamic uh, process than it is static. Like I'm now here, I'm here, I'm here. And sometimes it's all of them. So I appreciate you sharing with that. Um, so, but I'm going to start challenging us now and to go a little bit deeper because we need to encounter the love of God. And as believers, we're called to dwell on Christ's love. But sometimes I sit with church members and I think their walk isn't based on love. It's based on obligation. I mean, we say things like, I'm compelled by love or in this church, we're compelled by grace. But in reality, we're awful, often compelled by guilt and compelled by obligation. This is what I, I term the danger of the shoulds. You know what I mean by shoulds? You know, I should do, so I should go to church every Sunday. I should go to church every Wednesday. I should go to group. <clears throat> you should go to group. Uh, I should go to group every week. I should go to give more. I should serve more. I, you know, I should love my neighbor better. I should not be angry. I should flip my mattress every three months which is a pause. I just looked this up. Did you know you're supposed to rotate your mattress every three months? Because I don't. I just rotated my mattress. That was the first time in, I think, three years. But if you don't get anything out of this message, rotate your mattress every three months and your box springs every six to keep them in optimal health. Now, that's a completely aside the point. But, you know, living out of obligation is never fulfilling. You see, if I'm staying married, now you should stay married and you should try to work through your problems, but if I'm staying married only because it's an obligation, that marriage isn't fulfilling. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to shrivel up your heart and your, your heart is going to grow, grow cold. You see, um, the marriage that's fulfilling is one that's born out of love, not obligation. I meet a lot of people that say, well, I'm staying at my job because I'm obligated. If you stay at a job that's you're obligated because you're on a project or you whatever, it becomes non-unfulfilling and eventually your heart shrivels and dies. And I'm going to even say that for some of us, you're staying a Christian because you're obligated by your family or expectations. And the reality is you've long ago checked out of Christianity and it, you're just doing it because it's an obligation and it's not fulfilling. And the problem is, or I should say the problem, the solution to all of those is encountering the love of Christ. Otherwise, Christianity and all we do for God is just simply ob observation. I mean, what I want to ask you is, do you know the love of Christ? Because knowing the love of Christ and the love of God will radically change you. How radically? Well, Jesus even only gave one commandment in the whole New Testament. It's a pretty simple commandment. You don't have to switch there to your Bibles, but in, on the pamphlet in front of you, um, you have John 13, 34 and 35. Listen to this one new commandment. All the, all the whole Bible, Jesus gives only one new commandment. Here it is, John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, did you catch that? Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So my question for you is, how did Jesus love them? Was it just one of those, hey man, I love you. I love you, man. Or was it real, tangible? I mean, or did he just say, hey, I love you, and they didn't actually know what that meant? I think it was more than that. I think it was meaningful. I mean, I think it meant giving to them individually, which is like the loaves and fishes. Or it meant protecting them when they needed it, like calming the storm. Or what about just holding them or letting them lounge on him as they reclined at the table with him? Maybe it was just speaking words of encouragement to them. You know, words like, these words I say to you, 
and he encourages them, even in their failing. What about serving, doing acts of service? Did Jesus wash their feet? I think so. You see, Jesus showed tangible love to his disciples. So when he said to them, just as I have loved you, so also you're to love one another, then they actually had a tangible knowing of God's love. And so when he said, now turn to your brother and love him like I've loved you, it wasn't something that was, oh, I'm going to love him. They knew how to love him. And I think, this is my opinion, but I think Jesus was intentional about connecting with each one of their love languages so that they would know that he genuinely cared and loved for them in a real tangible way. So I'm going to pause for a second and I'm going to have you discuss a short moment with your small group. What are your love languages? Your, what are one or two of your love languages? And then how can you experience the love of Christ in a tangible way today? So I'm going to pause and then we'll pick it up. Now, most of your groups, we're coming back together again, most of your groups, I'm hoping, said that one of the ways you tangibly can experience God's love is through the body of Christ. And, and that's, that's what we're going to be talking about in just a second. I think that is what God's design was. But there is um, a little thing that I want to make. I want to make God's love really tangible for us. So there's something called a Calval Homer, which is a Jewish rhetorical device. And if I misspelled, said Calval Homer, I'm sorry, don't yell at me. But uh, basically, it's taking a simple truth and making it a complex truth. It's, it's those statements we see in the New Testament where it says, how much more does God, how much more? You know, so like when the lady found this, the, the coin and Jesus says, well, she celebrated, but how much more does God celebrate in heaven? Or when you find that lost sheep, how much more is that celebrated? You know, are you not much more valuable than a sparrow? So what it's doing is it's taking these tangible objects that we could see them and like, oh, yeah, if I, if I found a $100 bill, I'd be really excited. And then Jesus says, but how much more does God do that for us? And so that's kind of what I want to, want to take into encountering God's love is ask you, when was the last time you felt loved in a specific way? And then once you find that time, shift it to an eternal idea so we can connect with God's love. So let me give you an example about this. And this might sound a little bit corny, but it's a true example. So I like getting hugs. I know I'm, I'm a hugger. It's weird. I'm not a tree hugger, though I'm an environmentalist and I care about the environment, but I try not to hug trees because they're pokey and scratchy and, and in Arizona when you hug a tree it's a cactus and I did that once it doesn't it doesn't work so just trust me on that so but anyway that's beside the point I like to be hugged you know it's it's one of the ways I my love tank gets filled up you know one of my love languages is physical touch so just a hug is like whoa awesome so the other day I'm, I'm going about and I, I went to go meet my mentor and um, anyway so I, I'm at the coffee shop he comes in and we've already talked about a lot about this, but first thing that he does is he just comes in and just hugs me. You know, just mm, gives me a hug. And it's not like one of those those wimpy man hugs, you know, the, those wimpy ones where it's like, mm, Jesus loves you, or like making sure you get like two, three arms in there because you don't want anything to actually touch. That would be awkward. No, it was like one of those genuine like man hugs, like, oh, and he just holds me and says, oh, so good to see you. And in that moment, my, my, my heart just went and it was just filled with love because it was genuinely love and I knew how much he cared for me and loved me by that simple act. And now I simply just take that and I reflect it on God, you know, because that was really tangible. But how much more does the, is, does the Father embrace me in his love? Huh. Now I understand how that looks like. You see, my mentor, I understood that. That was tangible. But now I can understand the greater love of the Father. And so, the body of Christ, we are called to tangibly love one another. And if we truly loved one another, we would find ways to tangibly love one another. 
So this is this third question, maybe a question for the group, it may be just a time of reflection. But I'm going to ask you now the question number three you have in front of you is, what is one time in this past week where you experienced your love language being fulfilled and your love tank refilled? I want you to pause and think about that moment and then just consider how much more does the Father love to do that for you or with you? So we're going to pause. Again, it might be a question in the group, maybe just be a time of reflection to just dwell on how much more the Father desires to do that with you. All right, as we come back in a little bit, I just want to say, encourage you, I'm hoping that your hearts were stirred and moved. That's not just a one-time thing. I mean, you can do that every single day. And what ends up happening is you start encountering God in tangible ways through the body of Christ and through other people on a daily basis. And this idea that God loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, doesn't just become a mental thing, it drops and our hearts are enlarged because Christ's love motivates us like nothing else and it sets the tone for all else in our lives. The more we know the love of God, the more we will love other people and the more we will live life fully. So we must know, we must learn not only to know the love of Christ, but to know the love of Christ. And that is, man, as your heart swells with the love of Christ, it will radically change you. And so we as believers are called to love. No wonder the love of Christ as demonstrated through his body compels us. See, that's going back to that first uh, second Corinthians passage. No wonder the love of Christ compels us to reach out to others. Now let me give you a quick simple analogy. Imagine you found a gas station. And for this gas station, anytime you went there, it was free. There was unlimited gas, it was completely free. Now I'm thinking that's a great deal, right? And they don't make you sign a contract. You just show up, you come, you leave, fill up. You can fill up your SUV or you can fill up your moped or whatever you got. And there's no charge. Wouldn't you want to go back? Probably I would. I'd go back like every day because I'd be afraid it'd end, right? It'd be too good. I would worry it would be end. But not only that, once I learned after like keeping a secret for two or three weeks because I'm a little selfish in this, but then I would invite my friends and say, hey, come check this out. I think it works for everybody. Then I would invite my family. And eventually I'd start telling more people because I would want them to enter into this blessing. Why do I give that such a simple analogy? Because that's what the church is supposed to be. You see, Imagine the church is a place where your love tank is filled, where your love tank is, your love needs are met in tangible ways, where you walked into a church, not only to receive love, but to give love, where you were intentional about connecting and trying to meet the needs of others in a love so that they would be filled up with love and they would leave full of love. Or imagine yourself, coming in and just being drained and walking in and having people pour out into you and filling up your love tank. And then you walk out. You know what would happen? If you had a church like that, people would want to show up because we're all needing people to pour love into us and we need people to pour love into. And I think, and I might be wrong, but I think that was what Jesus was talking about in John where he says, love others as I have loved you, because of this the world will know. That would be a radical community. You see, um, his love is what will transform our communities and our love, our, pardon me, our communities and each other. And it will transform our lives. How does this look? Well, Christ's love motivates us. You know, His salvation that he bought through the atonement, it motivates us to to receive His love. His love is to give us a newness of life. His love reorientates our mind to see the importance of people around us. And the body of Christ, which we are, are as tangible hands to love one another. And also it motivates us because we're filled with love. We want to pour love out around us. 
So what does this look like in your community? Well, around our community, that as a church noted, 15% of residents go to church. That means 85% don't. The vast majority of people that go to work with you, live next to you, they don't go to church, never been to church. But why would they go to church? They just see church as dogmatic stuff. But the fields are ripe for harvest. And so the church is calling us to two very specific things in this next few months. The first is one love, and the second one is love one. So the first one looks like this. That is, we need to encounter a vertical love from God. We need to have a heart encounter with God that energizes and fills us up. May this community be that place where people come in and they're filled up, and then they go out full of the love that splash off on other people. But secondly, see, the second thing is we're called, our church is calling us to love one. Would you love just one person? I mean, would you just consider one person around you that you will willingly, intentionally pour into in this season? That you will pour in the love of God, and it will cost you, I realize that, but it will be worth the cost. You see, as we start, we go back to the beginning, the main point is that the love of Christ, encountering the love of Christ is important, but the love of Christ compels us like nothing else will in our lives. So the challenge before us is to love it, is to experience it, to respond to the love, and then invite and call others into that love. And that, I think, is the gospel. It's this radical, the church is a gas station that fills up people's love tanks and invites them to. And that just sounds so countercultural, but think that's what we're called to. Now I leave you with these last two questions. Um, again, number four, the one I would just encourage you that tonight don't leave without having at least one person that you, you're going to commit to and say for the next two or three months, I'm going to love that person. Doesn't mean you're going to lead them to the Lord. Now we hope that, but it does mean that you're going to intentionally love them in tangible ways, that you become the hands and the feet of Jesus to the world and also to the people around you. Well, I look forward to again to seeing you guys soon, and uh, let me know if you've got questions, but uh, look forward to it. Give you those last two questions to dive in as a group.